now we've got a case study. Somebody mentioned Mazda there. We're going to get more on that now. Our quick mixed-use case study is Mazda City. And to deliver that, it's a pleasure to welcome the Managing Director of Emerald Integrated Facilities Management, Jason Ruland. Jason, can you join us, please? Thank you very much indeed. When I come to these events, it's all about networking, about finding who's the poacher, who's the gamekeeper. So we're going to do that really quickly now. There's four categories that people in this room fall into, and I want to find out who you are. So if you're in facilities management, uh, managing a property, put, put your hand up now. Okay, that's category one. Okay, hands down. All right, guys, now you need to watch out who, come, who puts their hands up next. Two is your uh, property real estate management, service fee collection, working on behalf of a developer or a client. Put your hand up. Okay, potential clients there, good. Uh, third is a supplier. You provide products to the FM uh, and to the, uh, the real estate. Put your hands up. Okay, good. Now this is the good one. Hopefully there's a couple of clients in the room where I'm gonna have to change my talk. If you're a client that buys facility management services, put your hands up and hold them up so everyone knows who you are. All right, excellent, brilliant. Um, so uh, I got asked to do a bit of a case study, um, and it was about mixed, mixed development, and I, and I kind of found it really hard to kind of make it work, because most of you work for the facility management industry, and I, and I kind of wanted to make it something that you're going to walk away with rather than a bit of a, bit of a sales pitch. Um, so the one I picked is Mazda City, and it's absolutely a mixed development, uh, but I want to talk a bit about some of the challenges uh, that we have as the FM company operating there. We've been there for about two years. Um, as, as an FM myself, working in the GCC, um, what, what I find here is that uh, the scale and uh, the speed of the projects coming online uh, is absolutely amazing. It, it's fantastic. I've never seen it anywhere in the world. Um, and even from Cityscape, when they kind of launch what they're going to bring online next is, is very daunting for an FM. Uh, that the pace these buildings are moving at, the technology that's being squeezed into this building, it, it's scary stuff. Uh, and FM is, is running very fast to try and keep up with the technology that's being thrown in there. Um, there was an IT director that kind of explained it to me. It, it's like being at the coal face. When you, when you put this uh, innovation into a building, that technology, um, it's brutal because you know, there's not a lot of support for it. Um, you know, finding the right resources to maintain it. Um, there's glitches, there's problems with it, um, and who do you turn to when you have those challenges with it? Because you know, the visionaries that are bringing these projects online, they want that technology, they want that innovation, they want their project to stand out, and then it's then for FM to kind of kind of mop it up from there. Um, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a bit about when you do take over a building, sometimes you you inherently pick up a system. Uh, that is, it's very high end, it's very complex, um, and, and the challenges around that is that when there's no support in the GCC, what, what do you do? Because uh, you can't turn the system off, uh, you can't ignore it, you're going to have to do something about it. Uh, and it could be could a host of reasons, so examples that I've seen since I've been here is that the contractor that installed it wasn't paid, so he refused to come back to the GCC and never wants to work here again, so you can't get the maintenance for it. Uh, second one is it was installed by the guy that developed the product. His company doesn't operate anymore, he's retired, and again, you can't get support for it. Uh, third, it's been brought from another country, they don't have operations here, uh, and you can't, get, you can't get support for it here as well. So, and, and I've seen it quite regularly in some of the buildings that we've, we've adopted where these systems um, are very, 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 very hard to kind of maintain and, and get access to just because the resource isn't there. So, Mazda City, absolutely fantastic building. If you haven't been there, you need to go see it. It's, it's free. Uh, you can go walking around. You can look at all the technology they've got uh, in, in Mazda City. Um, Mazda City was, um, if I remember correctly, it's um, Mubadla. Uh, it's an arm of Mubadla. Uh, it was established in 2006. It's solely owned. Uh, they started the groundworks in 2008. Um, the, the Mazda master plan, they've built the city elements with the institute, uh, the university, uh, and there's a bit of retail and accommodation there for the students as well. And they're now moving on to the second phase, which is the residential, which is going around it. Um, the whole idea of it was that they wanted to develop um, a city that was green to show with urbanization, you know, how can you manage waste energy, um, 
and do that in an effective way with technology that we have available to us in the market now. But they also wanted to create a hub uh, that developed next, you know, next gen uh, innovation for, for energy waste management sustainability, and they, they, they pin that on their, their institute that sits inside that. They, they created some fantastic scientific labs. Uh, they, they connected a university to it, uh, and the idea was to bring in good students, uh, good professors, and, and start driving that innovation and see what they can find. Um, and like anything, once you start to create that entrepreneurial innovation zone, uh, it's a natural kind of hunting ground for, for investors that want to throw their money into potentially products that are going to change the world um, um, and be, be, be great business products to bring online. So Mazda has their own capital investment program that supports any initiatives that come out from Mazda City. Um, and also they look for technologies externally they can bring into Abu Dhabi, UAE and the GCC. Um, so from an establishment of mixed use, uh, it's got everything going on. It's got corporate offices, uh, it's got residences for the, uh, the students, it's got a university, uh, and there's a couple of buildings where they run all their experiments from for when they do all their um, development of their products coming through. Uh, there's coffee shops, restaurants, um, and you know, for me it's just, it's, it's, it's a small city that um, uh, uh, provides a great place for, for innovation. So to give you an example, uh, on the left is a, it, it's their, their concept on an Arabic uh, wind, wind tunnel. Uh, it's 45 meters high, it's got louvers at the top. Uh, the louvers will open into the prevailing winds, uh, which then draws wind down into a tunnel. The tunnel is a uh, non-stick uh, material, uh, goes through, it gets a little bit of um, water cooling applied to it, and then it's dispersed at ground level. Um, there's no mechanical uh, feed to it, uh, but if you go into Mazdar City, it feels a lot, lot cooler, three or four degrees cooler than, than, than the outs, um, outside of Mazdar City. On the right is their PRT system. Again, this is them investing in money, showing how public transport can, uh, can work for a city. Uh, it's a small scale. It takes you from the car park uh, to the institute. Um, it's got mag magnets in the concrete floor. Uh, on the top is a Wi-Fi connection that drives the, the, the vehicles. Um, it's all automated. Uh, the vehicles, when they park up to pick someone up, is when they, when they charge. Um, and it provides 24 operations to Mazda City. The bottom photo, the right is the residence, the left is the corporate offices. You can see solar panels at the top and you've got the wind tunnel. And then down the bottom is where they've got the, uh, the retail uh, that's mixed, mixed into it. Now to talk about complex systems. So the Institute runs some pretty, pretty amazing uh, experiments and projects inside there. So they're looking at things like next generation fuels for the world, so things like biofuels. Uh, so an experiment of, of that nature can run for up to eight months as they grow the algae blooms and then look to process the algae blooms and turn it into a biofuel. Um, the equipment, the technology um, to allow companies, the students to set up and do their tests um, are very high end. And it's both a focus at the university, but it's also uh, focused on uh, private investors that may want to come in and do their own, do their own experiments. Um, and we have to support um, these facilities. Now the case study I'm going to talk about uh, is actually in the science labs, in the institute itself. Um, this is my rough attempt to try and describe a, um, a fume extract system uh, at Mazda City. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about how, how complex, uh, complex it is. Um, three floors. Uh, on all the floors, there is a, a station where you can set up any experiment you want. And above it, there's a duct where you can connect whatever experiment you're working on. And if you've been to school and used a, an old fume hood, they're still using those. And a fume hood is where you can do an experiment, gases come off it, um, it splashes, and then the exa exhaust system extracts those gases, takes it to the roof, and then sends it out the top. So not, can, you know, not, not affecting the people carrying out the experiments or the people kind of operating in the building. On top of each fume hood is a Phoenix valve, clever little piece of equipment, which I'll kind of show you on the, on, on the next slide. Uh, that just regulates the, uh, the flow. They're all interconnected, all three floors go up and they go to the top where they, um, uh, they meet a strobic, strobic fan uh, which then takes exhaust gas and throws out the top. On the roof as well there's a control center where they've got variable speed drives, uh, there's a control center um, and there's air sampling unit that sits in there. Now the reason this is all complex is that during an experiment um, you have to maintain a certain pressure uh, within, within that ductwork. So um, they may have two experiments going on, so maybe one fan needs to be switched on to provide the right pressure for that building. 
Um, and at any stage, the pressure drops below a certain level, it goes into alarm mode. It switches off everything um, and closes down the Phoenix valves. And the reason it does that is they don't want gas or any chemicals returning back into other people's experiments or back into the people carrying out um, the testing, the students, uh, all the scientists working there. So it's a bit of a safety protocol that's built into, built into the system. Um, so the VSDs, the controller, are making sure the fans maintain uh, the right pressure um, to that building. And in this situation, we'd been the FM there for a couple of years, and the institute approached us and said they'd been having a couple of glitches um, with, the, um, with the system, and I'll, and I'll talk about what those glitches are and then kind of how we, how we resolve those. Fantastic bit of kit. The way the design is that the exhaust gas comes in from the bottom, they're very efficient direct drive motors, uh, and then what it does, it sucks in fresh air from the bottom and the top and ejects it uh, like an airplane out the top, nice and high. It adds about 170% more oxygen uh, or air to the, to the mix, and, and what, how this helps, it, it uh, reduces the smell, um, and it can reduce the toxicity of the air um, that's been, been released as well, so it doesn't affect the people at the bottom. Um, in, on the right is the control center, they're the VSDs that are connected to the strobic fans, and there's also a Phoenix control unit. Um, it's got a program in there that tells how the system uh, operates and when things need to come on. Um, on the left hand, ha left hand side is the fume, uh, fume hoods. Um, these are simple, these activate when you lift up to about they hot that high, uh, the, uh, the Phoenix valve will open, uh, it will then start drawing fresh air from the fume hood uh, and then it pushes it all, all the way through to the top of the roof. On the right hand side is the, um, the alarm system. Um, when the pressure drops to a certain level, that's when it activates the Phoenix valve, shuts everything off, but it's not just for that valve, it's for the whole entire building, um, which can affect other experiments in there. And that's the actual Phoenix valve. Um, and the reason they're clever is they're self, self controlling. Uh, there's just a cone that sits inside that moves back and forth that changes the diameter of the exhaust to keep the pressure um, at the design requirements uh, for the system. So this is where it gets a little bit complex because um, we've, never, we've never touched one of these before. Yeah, and it's been put into a building, the developers put in there. The guy that designed it comes to the US, it's one guy. Um, the Phoenix and Strobic fans, they're common common piece of equipment that sit out there, but the whole system was designed by one guy and that company doesn't exist anymore. So the challenge with that was how do we fix it? Now the problem that we, uh, they had was on a couple of occasions, um, they had full alarm go off in the lab and they couldn't determine why the alarm was going off and closing down all the Phoenix valves. So a lot of the scientists, a lot of students um, were um, a little bit annoyed that their experiments had to be canned. Yeah, so we're talking months in, weeks in, a lot of investment. Uh, they literally have to rip up and start again. Um, and that can be costly, timely, um, especially when you've got uh, heavy investment that sit behind you. So they really wanted to get, it was, a, it was a niggle, not a problem, and they wanted to just make sure that it was gonna cause further problems uh, for, for the university and for those experiments keep being, being conducted. So, what I'm going to do is talk about how you as FMs can approach it because there's a point where you kind of have to step over the threshold and go, we need to deal with the problem. Um, the first place I would recommend as an FM company is approach your suppliers um, and your partners. You'll tend to find that they've probably played with this type of equipment somewhere before. So rather than looking at the control system, look at the equipment's in there. So who's installed strobic fans? Who's installed, uh, installed Phoenix valves? Um, once you find the contractors that have been doing that, you can pretty much work your way back to someone that's been working on the implementation of control systems that, that, that sit in there. The second is uh, root, um, uh, who has maintained the system. So in this situation, we weren't the first in Mazda City. Uh, we asked who's been maintaining it before, found out no one had been maintaining it before. So again, it kind of left us high and dry. So without that support within the GCC, um, the pressure was on us to resolve the issue and get it rectified for our client. Now, this is Emil's approach, but I'd say this is the approach that you guys need, need to take. When you start to get uh, system failure, system faults on a very complex system, um, it's amazing to see how many people come around the table to offer advice of how to resolve that issue. So firstly, you get the client that's demanding it needs to be fixed, it needs to be fixed now. You have the project team that are offering up their advice of what the problem could be. Uh, you then have the FM contractor that's also offering their bit in there. Each is chipping away at the problem and with root cause analysis, if they're all chipping at the wrong direction, you can actually fail to get to the bottom of the problem of what's causing it. 
So in our situation, we appoint either a technical director from our center of excellence or a technical manager to manage the root cause analysis um, and make sure they're seen as the person driving that process. Um, and I've used that a couple of times in my career in FM and it's worked very effectively. The second is, in Emerald, we have a very strong process around doing root cause analysis, getting down to the problem. The systems are fairly straightforward. Normally, it's the control systems, uh, which are very, very complex. That's where all the coding and efficiencies, driving energy efficiencies, making sure the system is running um, at an optimum uh, for the site. Um, then you need to focus on business continuity. It's fine to make a fix, but if you're picking a one-man band from the US again uh, and he disappears, then you may be back in the same position. So whenever you put the fix in place, make sure you understand that there's a support network either locally or internationally that you can kind of bring in to support uh, the changes to it. You also need to work on a recovery plan. Um, this has saved uh, my backside several times, is that when you're implementing a significant change to a system, is try and keep the old system in place uh, at switchover and changeover. Uh, and from that point of view is that once you make the change, if the system doesn't work and the fault's still occurring, you can then push back to what the old system was. And you know, for Mazda City, the system was okay. It was just a bit niggly. So making that change, you need to make sure that um, it's going to work. Um, the root cause for Mazda City was we looked at the, the, the control system that controls uh, the uh, strobic fan and the Phoenix valves, closed protocol, we had no passwords, no one had passwords for it. We couldn't get into the system to make any modifications. But what, what the root cause analysis showed us was the VSDs were designed to uh, kick in over a certain time, slow startup. So during a during an experiment, if there was two fume hoods open, it goes to one fan unit. And a one fan unit is designed that after a thousand hours, it will then uh, transfer to another fan. It's just using your assets in an effective way. But during that switchover, during low, low volume, the VSD would slowly ramp up the second motor. Um, and what you found was a pressure drop in the system. The Phoenix valve detected it, the sensor detected it, and then the whole system would shut down. So we didn't have access into... Um, into the control unit to make the changes to the VSD, giving the client two options. One is we turn off the VSDs and they don't get the energy savings from, from the property. Or the second is we put in a new controller. Phoenix controllers, are, you can buy them anywhere. Um, it's just finding someone that, who can program. And after looking with our partners and our suppliers, we actually found a supplier that can do control, uh, control requirements for, uh, for these type of systems. So the recommendation to the client was swap your controller out um, using a local supplier who's got access to it. You can get the maintenance for it. And if there's any issues, you can make the changes to it. So it was a fairly, fairly simple fix to kind of do it. Uh, but we had to go through a lengthy process to kind of, kind of resolve it. Um, other than that, that was about it for my case study. So thank you.